You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Weekend house calls. This is where I am able to, figuratively speaking, step into your house, sit down with you at least for a couple moments, read your question out loud to our community, and then be able to give you my best reference and my best recommendations based on where I believe you should start or what you might be missing as a part of the puzzle that will allow you then to get well, to lose the weight, and to reverse that aging-based process. So always excited to do these calls. I look forward to them each and every week. I hope that you do as well. We release them every Saturday and Sunday. And, um, you know, it's a lot of fun because it's also many topics, meaning that a lot of these questions I would not be able to dedicate an entire podcast to, but I can dedicate three or four minutes to each individual question. And that is a great place for you to jump off from. So again, if you ever want to check if your question has already been answered or your topic, I can't recommend enough heading over to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. And the reason is this, that it's going to take about seven weeks or so, maybe even eight weeks for me to answer your question live on the Cabral concept. However, you can see if I answered your question or your topic already over the past, let's see what today's show is, episode one, four, three, six. So it's at stephencabral.com forward slash one, four, four, three. Last weekend was one, four, three, six on Saturday. So today is episode one, four, four, three. And of course, if you go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, you could type in any number of keywords such as ulcerative colitis or migraines or PCOS or any number of questions, right? So feel free to type it in there. See if I've answered it before. It could save you about seven or eight weeks. And then if you don't want to wait, always feel free to ask your question and to our community at cabralsupportgroup.com. That is our free Facebook group. And uh, you're welcome to join with about 8,000 people from around the world and counting. So check that out. But now let's dive right into our show. So our first question as I'm scrolling through the mega document of questions right now is from Olga. And Olga is writing in chronic hay fever and long-standing exposure to pesticides, DDT, welding fumes, etc. What is the connection and how to normalize the immune response? Would detox be appropriate? Thanks, Olga. Olga, thank you for writing in. And I appreciate this is something that I talk about quite a bit in the rain barrel effect. So here's the thing. Pesticides are around us all the time. If we're not eating organic-based foods, then most likely there's an herbicide, a fungicide, a pesticide, something sprayed on those foods besides all of the waxes and chlorine and coatings and radiation that they spray foods with. Now, that's one part. DDT you mentioned, which is a scary thing, outlawed over 40 years ago but still in our environment. Why? It just doesn't go away. It does not break down and deteriorate beyond its base level form. Pretty scary stuff. And then there's welding fumes, which are invisible to the naked eye. So that doesn't even count all the daily chlorine, aluminum, et cetera, that we're exposed to. So what is the appropriate action? It is to detoxify. It is to do a functional medicine detox, ideally the 21 day. And then what we want to do is we don't want to just stop right? We want to then maintain with a 12, 14, or maybe even 16 hour fast to allow the body to do its job, but not if you're not using something like the daily foundational protocol. We can't expect our liver to keep up with all of these man-made toxins, the 77,000 plus in the world, without giving it some support. 
meaning that these toxins are real. People want to say, oh, there's no such thing as toxins and your liver can keep up. Well, here's the thing. Your liver can't keep up because you can do a blood test, a urine test, or a sweat test, and you can see the toxins that are still stored in individuals. They do this all the time. Remember, I do this all the time. This is not made up. This is the real thing. It really does exist. So 21-day functional medicine detox. You can check ours out at equilibriumnutrition.com and then maintain with the daily foundational protocol. And you can, again, check that out at equilibriumnutrition.com. So again, I can't give you medical advice can't cure, treat, or diagnose disease, but I can give you a place to get started. And then, of course, functional medicine lab testing would be a great next place to start. Okay, we've got Daniel up next. Really long question. I'm not able to read really long questions on the podcast. The reason is it would take up all of our 22-minute show. So let's read and give you then the synopsis of what Daniel is asking. And you can read Daniel's full question at stephencabral.com forward slash one. Four four three. Okay. Daniel says, first off, thank you for your service. You made a huge and positive impact in many lives and continue to additionally spread your name and message around. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate that. He says, 44-year-old male, struggling with daily migraines. Anything preventative has made it worse besides propanol. So he basically just talks about taking his medication. Did a lot of research on eliminating food sensitivities. Testosterone has always been low. So I thought I would try TRT, which is testosterone replacement therapy. Currently on testosterone, switched and working with Julia Hayes in our practice, who's an amazing health coach. I was now deficient in many vitamins and minerals. She put me on a good path. My question is to you. Two years ago, I went for an abdominal ultrasound, ended up being gastritis, talking about daily protocol. All right. So really looking for the best protocol to help with what seems to be migraines, unless I'm on the wrong track. And what I recommend, everyone, this is a nice, kind of a nice side. Let's keep the questions to about, let's say, five to eight sentence maximum. And the reason is that I can't make it an individual consultation. And the truth is that I have to spend, I do an hour intake. So again, you could never give me all the information in the world. Just give me like really what it is and and what's going on. I I don't even necessarily need to know all the different supplements you're taking because I'll give you the recommendations. But but the truth is that you can write in whatever you want and I'll be able to help with it either way. I'll do my best. Okay. Just wanted to put that in there. Basically, here's what I look for. You said you get relief from one thing and that is propanol. propanol. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Either way, it's a high blood pressure medication. So when we look at that, we say, okay, it's a beta blocker. Well, what are we really doing? Well, we're talking about regulating and calming blood pressure and also arterial-based constriction. That's important to look at that because for me, then I say, okay, is this high cortisol? Is this a sodium to magnesium balance? Is this a calcium to magnesium balance? If you have not run a minerals and metals test, the hair tissue mineral analysis with Julia Hayes, I would do that. You know, She works with Equilibrium Nutrition and in my private practice, she is fantastic. Then I would do that. I would absolutely look at that. And then I would also say, what are your omega-3s? Are you taking enough omega-3s? It looks like you're taking two a day, which is great. So we want to look at these specific things. I would also ask you, when did this start to come on? Like what triggered it in the first place? Were you under tremendous amounts of stress? Have you worked on that? Have you tried to work on um, heart rate variability relaxation-based techniques? Have you worked on decreasing any environmental-based contamination? There's so much that we would have to look at. And I don't believe that taking a TRT is going to help the situation for sure, but we want to make sure that it doesn't further exacerbate it as well. So at least it's a start to get, I would look say, what is the inflammatory-based cause? That's what I'm looking for. Like what's causing you to have this vasoconstriction most likely with high blood pressure? Is it just stenosis? Is it hardening of the arteries? I need to know more, right? I need to look at blood work. I need to look at what's going on in your body in order for me to give you the best assessment possible. And then of course, also look at histamines. For example, do high histamine foods trigger your migraines? So aged foods, smoked foods, fermented foods. Are these things that give you migraines as well? It's a place to get started. Daniel, thank you for writing in. I appreciate you. Patty's up next. Dr. Paul, I'm a huge fan of your podcast. With all the podcasts I've listened to, I've never heard you talk about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. 
and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but I think that I have talked about that. I'm going to look that up in one second. I'm wondering if you have treated anyone with this condition, and if so, what you used and how much. My daughter has this condition along with POTS, mast cell activation disorder, celiac disease. She tries to eat pretty clean and has been gluten-free for a year. I'm looking forward to your thoughts on this. All right, so first, let's just head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast because I don't even know if I've spoken on this in particular before. Then let's go down to that search box, scroll right down. All right, that little pesky drop down. And then we are going to look at Ehlers, E-H-L-E-R-S, Danlos syndrome, which again, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And yes, I talked about it on episode 1121. So I just want to make sure that everyone goes over to 1121 for my answer on that because I talked about this particular connective tissue disorder and also talked about uh, the issues surrounding the inflammation with this. So I definitely recommend uh, checking out my answer on that in full because I, I don't want to repeat only because I'm answering questions right now from November 22nd and we are into mid-January. So just in, in respect to everyone's questions, but I dealt with POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and I dealt with mast cell activation disorder as well. Both of them had to do with electrolyte imbalance as well as my inability, so my absolute inability to control gut-based function. So I had to get rid of candida overgrowth, I had to get rid of my SIBO, and I had to get rid of my H. pylori. So please check out our gut-based testing at equilibriumnutrition.com. One is called Candida Metabolic and vitamins test. The other is called the bacteria and stool, a bacteria and parasite stool test. Check those out. Can't recommend them enough. The to figure out what I did for pots, I had to rebalance my autonomic nervous system, which has to do with your fight or flight versus your parasympathetic nervous system. So sympathetic versus parasympathetic, and I had to rebuild my sodium stores back in my body. So I've talked about all these things though on the podcast. Please type in mast cell at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, and you can type in pots as well. Katie's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. I'm wondering what the reasons for seeing mucus in your stool might be. For years, I've dealt with it on and off. I've always just chalked it up to allergies and or IBS. I've done all the gut testing and I've done the CBO protocol, heal and seal mold protocol, and now I'm on an abridged CBO that my integrative health practitioner put me on. All this to say, I've done the gut work, but I do occasionally still see those mucusy stools. Any insights on why that might be and what causes them? Thank you for writing in, Katie. Great question. Yes, you may not have a full-blown gut issue and can still have mucus in your stool. So let's go back to why would we have mucus in the first place? So it's a really good. Let's look at it outside of our intestines for a moment. What if you have mucus in your nose or what if you have mucus in your throat, right? Why is it caused? Well, it's caused in the most part as a rebound effect to a sensitivity that caused inflammation. And that inflammation then will cause a mucosal response in terms of creating mucus, which allows more white blood cells to come to the area to fix damage or do damage control. And it will also allow for a coating over irritated and aggravated tissue or flesh. So let's look at that. Let's say that you're eating a very healthy food, and I have that in air quotes, but it might not be healthy for you. For example, let's say you're someone that just doesn't do well with nightshades, tomatoes and peppers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, when you eat those foods, you might get mucus in your stool. Why? Because they cause an inflammatory reaction inside of your 28 feet or so of digestive tract. And because of that, your body responds with the appropriate response which would be increasing mucus production so that it can drive more IgE, IgA, based immune cells to the area and to also coat the intestines so there's not further damage due to that inflammatory-based response. So hopefully this helps. You'll want to look at food sensitivities and also then categories of foods such as nightshades and lectins and all those fun foods that you'll go through. But you'll be able to figure this out. All you have to do is keep a food journal the mucus will have been created most likely from a food you ate within the last 24 to 36 hours maximum. So you'll be able to start to see trends. And with these trends, you will be able to come up with the answer for yourself being your own health detective. All right. Great question. Tara's up next. I'm a 56-year-old female 
no major health issues all my life, and just now diagnosed with cataracts. I've never been dependent on eyeglasses. I have some that would were seen at the movies, theater, or driving unfamiliar places at night, and just started wearing readers a couple years ago. However, since the cataracts, I really don't need readers. I've read that cold press hexane-free caster can help reverse cataracts, but I'm hesitant to try. I don't want to cause more damage. I'm currently on day six of the detox, and I'm searching for a solution other than surgery. I'd like to know if castor oil drops is okay or any other recommendations. So, you know, that's a really great question. You know that I can't give you exact treatments or cures or protocols over the podcast. That would be giving medical advice, and that is outside of my scope of practice. Just for people who want to know what cataracts are, really common. But um, typically, how did old did you say you were? 56. Okay, so typically... It doesn't start in the 50s, but it can. You know, it's not that it can't. It can be from all sorts of different issues. Genetic variants, of course, but really from too much UV exposure, all sorts, all sorts of different issues. I mean, I don't want to just kind of narrow out a few. But it is, and you can actually tell with a lot of people, there's a cloudy lens to the eye. So you look at someone and it's almost like reflective, like a gray reflective based lens of the eye. And so what we want to do is begin to look at all treatment options available to you. And again, I'm using treatment in quotations because we cannot provide treatment-based advice over the podcast. So let's look at three main ways. We have conventional medicine, which will use surgery. Now remember, cataracts can lead to blindness. So it is something that we need to take seriously and we need to begin to take measures on it. So there's surgery as an option. The second option And I don't know how much you've looked into this. I'm certainly not an expert on cataracts, but I've done the research. And there, I believe, again, there's something called Compound 29. And from my knowledge, just trying to recollect, this is based on N-acetylcysteine. Please don't quote me on this, but I believe it is based on N-acetylcysteine. And, or N-acetylcarnosine, I believe. I'm, I'm just retracing that in my mind. N-acetylcarnosine, N-A-C, instead of cysteine. Yes, that was correct, I believe. Now, this actually looked pretty good in the research. It is not a natural-based compound. It's a lab-based compound. So you'll want to look more into how they're using this compound 29 and what it looks like when I read it about a couple of years ago to what the new research looks at. So we have surgery. We have something called compound 29 which helps to reverse cataracts. And then we also have natural health-based protocols, which involves a couple things. So the first one is natural anti-inflammatories. We want to look at things like curcumin. We want to look at alpha lipoic acid, really powerful antioxidant-based compound, also detoxifying. I would work on detox. I would up my omega-3s to a healthy level. I would also make sure you're getting in your seven to nine servings of a rainbow variety of fruits and vegetables. And then I would look at using the eye health supplement that I've talked about before. You could just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and type in lutein, L-U-T-E-I-N as well. You don't have to type in the other one. It will just come up a zeaxanthin for a good eye-based product. That's where I would start. The castor oil on the eyes, I have heard of. So here's the thing. In Ayurveda, we actually used ghee. Other people have used castor oil and they created this, it looks like a moat, a dam. And what they did was they poured the melted ghee, of course, this is not hot, over the eyes inside of this dam and you can use castor oil. And what they did was they had the person slowly open the eyes to allow these healing-based oils to bring their phytonutrients, phospholipids, healthy fats to the eye itself. I cannot back that up, so I cannot tell you to do that. However, using a castor oil compress over your eyes and allowing a soaked piece of flannel with castor oil, maybe even a gentle heating pack on top of that to be over the eyes, I would not be against that. But I want you to do what you feel is right for you. But you can look at a previous podcast I did on castor oil packs, and that will tell you how to do that. That's a blast from the past. That's about like three years ago on the podcast. All right. Great question. Thank you for writing in. Can we get one more question? Let's get one more question. James is up next. Hi, Doc. I once heard somebody talk about how unhealthy fats like the various vegetable oils, canola oils, etc., were the worst thing for your body and that you can't utilize them at all. Before this, I was always in the impression that sugar was the worst thing for your body, but apparently, apparently we can utilize that. I guess this is a bit of a subjective question as it depends on specific health deficiencies and imbalancing determining what the worst food product is for you. But 
if you were to say, on the whole, what was the worst thing is, or the three worst things, for the majority of humans, what would they be? If you can't answer this question because it's two person specific, then you can answer me this question. Added sugar versus unhealthy oil. What is the worst for you and why? Even if you do answer the first, could you answer also answer the second? I'm quite interested in the sugar versus oil debate. Thank you so much, Doc. Your great James. All right. Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Appreciate the kind words. So, James, I love these types of questions because in our society, um, believe me, I'm right there with you as well. We want the silver bullet and we want the worst of the worst. I'll tell you right now, you just name the two. That is it. People are looking, how do people get diabetes? How do they get cardiovascular issues? How do they get this? How do they get that? It is typically not just one. It's typically not just sugar or it's typically not just these polyunsaturated fats. Why? Why then? Here's why. So James, this will make sense for your answer. When you take it, now remember, if you eat the vegetables and they contain the natural fat themselves, not an issue. We are talking about oils like canola oil or a soy oil that are then exposed to heat or sunlight, or they're oxidized. Remember, polyunsaturated means multiple open bonds. It's the best way to say it, because saturated means saturated bonds. So I don't want to get into oxygen and carbon and all of these different things, but we'll put it this way. They're easy to break down under heat. They're easy to break down under light, and they become free radicals. They cause free radical damage in the body. So they're really bad. But polyunsaturated fats also weaken our cell membranes. And then we also add something like sugar to our body. And then our cells are not able to utilize that glucose as well. So now you get the, del- the double whammy. Weak cells, flimsy cells filled with polyunsaturated fats because our cell membranes are called bilipid membranes made up of saturated fats and softer fats, right? So here's what we want to do. We want to eliminate both. Like what's worse? Well, they're both terrible. Like there's no one worse. Honestly, though, I would say this. If I had to pick a worst worse, for sure, it is uh, processed hydrogenated polyunsaturated fats. There's no doubt about it. Like if you could give me the worst thing, for sure, it's heated polyunsaturated fats. If you take something like a, a liquid vegetable oil and you turn it into a hard fat, there's, that, that's the worst. There's no doubt about it. It's terrible for your body. At, like you just said, at least your body can utilize glucose. It, sure, it's not going to be good in the long run, and it may cause weight gain, it may cause diabetes, it may cause other things, but if you need it, at least in small dosages, your body's going to be able to store it as liver glycogen, as glucose and, and fuel for the muscle cells. Your brain's going to use it. Your body has no need for these hydrogenated polyunsaturated vegetable oils. Don't use them. Stay away from them. But for sure, I don't need to name a third. You re- eliminate those two, you're doing a great job. All right. Thank you, everyone, for writing in. I appreciate you. As always, I've gone over my time limit, but hopefully it was helpful. And do feel free to share this show with anyone you believe it could help. Take care. And I'll see you tomorrow for part two of our house calls. Did you know that the body really only becomes sick or unbalanced in only two ways? Over time, you become deficient in vital nutrients and you also accumulate toxins internally and from the environment. As those nutrients diminish and you increase your total toxic load, your body then begins to show the first signs of dis-ease. It's actually quite predictable, and the good news is that if we know how you began to fill up that proverbial rain barrel, we also know how to empty it to begin the healing process. I was fortunate enough to learn this ancient healing process from my mentor after suffering from debilitating diseases for close to a decade. It was only when I began to implement these techniques did I finally overcome my illnesses and go on to live a life of energy and vitality that I now enjoy. I'd like to share with you now what I discovered after traveling all over the world and how to combine the best of ancient healing wisdom with state-of-the-art science. Allow me to teach you exactly how I've been able to help over a quarter of a million people to empty their rain barrel and begin to transform their body and lives into what they've always hoped they could be. To get your copy of the international bestseller, The Rain Barrel Effect, simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash rain barrel.